Lewis families. In the history of present illness, at the background of this case is the pandemic. This pandemic has been particularly difficult to Louis. While he enjoyed having a good income from his tailoring before the pandemic and took pride of his role in his family as provider, the pandemic caused a decrease in tailoring jobs available for him. The decreased, decreased opportunities resulted in decreased income for Louis. This has caused Louis to regret the COVID situation and feel inadequate or kulang in complying with his role in the family. Despite this, he had continued to look for jobs and to get by the economic losses of the pandemic. Although he felt somehow depressed in the early part of the pandemic, he denied any other depressive symptoms, such as disturbed sleep and decreased appetite, poor concentration, low energy, psychomotor retardation, or suicidal ideation. Moreover, he denied persistent depressive mood later on as he has come to adapt to and accept what has happened to the world in general. 22 days prior to consult marked about a month since Louis became in contact with Sheila, a resident from their barangay through an online messaging mobile application. Sheila is a childhood friend or kababata who is working as a domestic helper in Dubai. Constant communication online between the two developed into a long distance romantic interest. 15 days prior to consult, Sheila agreed to become Louis' girlfriend. While he was reluctant before to share romantic interests with his mother, he, has, he was elated with this relationship with Sheila, that he eagerly shared this with his mother. Louis's mother, however, had reservations about his relationship. She reminded Louis that Sheila had previously been married with two kids. She is also known to be separated from her previous partner and had been rumored to have been remarried through a Muslim ceremony to a local resident in their community as well. Louis brushed this off, claiming that Sheila denied being married twice and that she is currently single and free to engage in a relationship with Louis. Despite feeling somehow disappointed with his mother's reaction with regards to Sheila, Louis continued on with his relationship. He became excited as they both planned to live together and have kids. Louis had been hoping to find a partner in life and build his own family. To Louis, Sheila is the answer to his prayers and the one who will make him feel complete. Fifty days prior to consult, Louis's mother told him that it had come to her from the neighbors that Sheila had indeed been married to a local resident through a Muslim ceremony. Her second husband was someone she met abroad and they are still in communication with each other. Although Louis confronted Sheila about this and she kept on denying it, Louis became worried that his relationship with Sheila will come to an end. Although Sheila is his second girlfriend, he had invested a lot of emotions in their relationship and he felt more deeply in love with Sheila than to his first girlfriend. To him, losing Sheila would mean also that his dreams of having his own family will not come into fruition. In the interim, his relationship with Sheila continued. Despite the deep deepening feeling that Sheila might leave him because of her complicated status, Louis continued to work despite having depressed feelings, sleep disturbance, and spending lesser time with his friends and nephews. He denied other depressive symptoms and manic symptoms as well. While Louis, Louis denied use of alcohol, he admitted to having increased intake of nicotine from his usual two to five stick, sticks per day to 10 sticks per day. Two days prior to consult, Louis was noted to stare blankly and mumbling to himself. He refused to take a bath and would, come, uh, and would become aggressive towards family members, even unprovoked. Louis recounts that during those times, he was hearing five male voices he identified as his neighbors, what are voices talking about him saying he is crazy because he keeps on smoking cigarettes. Buang ning tawhana, sige lang sigarilyo. Louis also admits to having ideas of reference, referring to his neighbors talking about him. Thinking that he only needed sleep, his siblings prodded him to sleep and monitored his food intake. However, Louis would have made insomnia and the mumbling to himself continued. He continued to have increased nicotine intake at 10 cigarette sticks per day. A day prior to consult, Louis' symptoms persisted. This time, he became more agitated and attempted to choke his mother. When approached, he would suddenly lunge at his siblings and attempt to punch them. He would also shout expletives, yawa mo, and other host hostile words against his family members. Persistence of symptoms prompted consult, prompted the patient's sister to bring him in for consult. So for the past psychiatric illness of this patient, he was previously admitted in 2016 at this institution with a diagnosis of mid-psychotic disorder 
alcohol use disorder and tobacco use disorder. He was then given Respiridone 2 mg per tab, one tab two times a day for a year. And the, and the attending physician by that time discontinued the drug. Uh, Luby, however, went back to premorbid functioning with no symptoms of psychosis thereafter. Also note of possible trigger at that time was the, was the failure to comply with the deadline in a tailoring contact. Louis had no previous diagnosis of depression, no suicide attempts, and no history of violence or homicidality. For non-psychiatric illness, Louis had no known comorbidities. For the family history, it is, uh, it is significant for a uh, positive family history of a first cousin in the maternal side with psychiatric illness, which was described as psychotic symptoms as well, such as hallucinatory gestures and disorganized behavior. This patient was seen also in ITBM. However, the records cannot be further retrieved because his records were prior to the fire. And this patient was also lost to follow up as well. They, they cannot recall the medications that are used by this particular patient. Non-psychiatric illnesses in the family is also not significant. Uh, there's no significant non-psychiatric illness in the family as well. So the patient lives with his father, mother, elder sister, and his two nephews. And uh, his other siblings, sister, uh, two sisters, and two brothers come home at weekends. So these are the other details of the family. So Louis' parents, Mario and Laura, met in social gathering in their barangay when Mario was 24 and Laura was 14. Mario worked as a construction worker while Laura was a fresh graduate from elementary. Despite the age difference, they had a short relationship and went on to marry each other. A year after, they had their first child. At 17 years of age, Laura gave birth to Louis. But the couple continued to have four other children spaced at least three years apart. At home, Laura takes care of the household chores and attends to her children's needs while Mario is out working for weeks, only returning home from time to time. In their household, their father is the decision maker and provider. He leads the household in, a, in an authoritarian style. On the other hand, his mother is a submissive homemaker. Mario's constant absence at home has often made Laura feel lonely, but she remained faithful and dedicated to her husband and children. Laura complied with the role of a supportive wife and never questioned Mario's decision, nor his parenting style. Although they may have some minor fights due to Mario's insensitivity towards her feelings, she recalls no major fights that caused a strain in their relationship. Besides being strict, Mario has worked hard to support their family. Life was economically hard for them, however. Mario was only a minimum wage earner and Laura did not have her own income. The family income can barely make ends meet. They experience scarcity of food to them, isang kahit isang tuka, and not being able to buy non necessities. Early in life, Louis and his siblings were taught of the value of hard work, being thrifty, and giving priority to basic needs. Louis describes his mother as caring and attentive to their needs, despite having so much to attend to. He feels close to his mother compared to his father, whom he describes to be a strict disciplinarian. During childhood, when Louis or his siblings committed mistakes, their father used to strike them with a belt buckler buckled or hard room to punish them, aside from the hurtful words he lashed at them. Louis remembered one time after he graduated in elementary, his father asked him to accompany him to work. In the process of helping out his father, he accidentally spilled a cement mi mixture and his father punished him without a second thought and told him he's worthless and unskilled. Dili kabalung magtrabaho. Without thought of the public display, his father took out his belt and hit Louis in the buttocks and upper legs to teach him a lesson. Louis not only felt pain physically, but he also felt humiliated and felt low because it seemed to him he will always be disappointing his father. Aside from verbal and physical abuse Louis has experienced from his father, he has also felt that he was less favored from than his other siblings. He attributed this to the fact that he was the eldest male in the family and he was expected to help both parents to do the heavy work. Although Louis mentioned he appreciated his father for his hard work for the family and not having any vices, he remained to have certain animosity with his father because of his childhood experiences. Louis had good relationships with his siblings and he mentioned no sleeping rivalry or jealousy. Louis is a product of a wanted pregnancy born to a G2P2 mother. A young mother admitted having, a young mother, Laura admitted having missed appointments with the local 
Medical Health Center during her pregnancy. She also missed taking vitamins given the doctor given by the doctors in the health center. Despite this, Laura reports no known complications nor infections when she was pregnant with Louis. Louis was delivered via normal spontaneous delivery with no known complications at home delivered by a midwife. Birth, Louis was recalled to be a robust baby with no with good cry and no hospitalizations during the newborn period. Louis received breast milk from birth to six months, after which he was weaned to table food. Breastfeeding continued until eight months of age. Developmentally, Louis grew up at par with his peers with no known delays nor childhood infection. Louis started school at seven years of age. Since he is the male, oldest male child, he was given heavier tasks at home to help out in the household chores. Balancing that and his school, he would often forget some tasks with, which would result to being punished by his father. His father would say her, hurtful words like palpaka, to which Louis would feel bad but would give to himself. At school, Louis received average grades, mostly 80 to 85 range. He had no favorite subjects. He had never experienced being bullied at school. He had no problems getting along with his classmates and teachers. He was never called out for disciplinary actions, and he enjoyed playing with his classmates, classmates especially with his male friends. When Louis was in high school, he came across classmates and schoolmates in school that were drinking alcohol and smoking cigarettes. He started to use the same vices as his friends because of peer pressure. He was outgoing with friends and would share extra class time with them. Louis' grades maintained at an average. He also continued to work with his father from time to time. He had learned to keep quiet every time his father gave snide remarks and chose to tolerate rather than confront him. It also became, became his way of handling family conflicts. He would keep quiet and turn away, and when his anger has abate, abated, he would forget about the issue and not bring it up anymore. After graduating from high school at age 16, Louis went to, appren to apprentice in a tailoring business run by his cousin. In a few months, he learned the skills to take tailoring jobs and became employed in the tailoring shop. He received good income from the job and which gave him the opportunity to buy his family comforts. Voluntarily, he would buy household necessities and appliances like a television, refrigerator, sofa, and other things as well. Louis became a valued family member, someone who could earn for his own and provide for his family as well. Having achieved self-sufficiency and becoming a valuable contributor to family income, Louis mentioned, however, that his father had reduced giving criticisms towards him, but he had not felt appreciated by his father. From time to time, Mario would somehow find fault in Louis' activities and make snide remarks. Although hurt by his father's criticism, Louis would choose to walk away when he feels angry and cool off and keep his hurt feelings to himself. Louis remained close to his mother and siblings, and he confides some of his problems to his mother and often laughs and jokes with her. He's also close to his siblings and he loves playing with his nephews. He mentions no conflict among them. Louis continued to go out with his friends from high school and would have drinking sessions with them. While he went out and drank with them for two to three times a week before 2016, when he was admitted, after he was admitted, he only drank occasionally at one to two times a month and no longer to inebriation. He continued to see his friends from time to time after that, despite drinking minimally just for pakikisang. During his pastime, he likes to go out to the neighborhood and talk with his friends about anything under the sun. He is he's described as palaistoya and good nature. Louis worked right after graduation from high school as a tailor, after a few months training under his cousin. He did not work other jobs other than that. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Louis' tailoring contacts reduced, and although initially disappointed with the meager income, he persisted and adapted to the needs of the current pandemic by sewing masks and driver shields. Louis identifies himself as male, attracted to the opposite sex, and had two girlfriends, including his current one. According to him, his first relationship lasted only for a few months when he was 6, 20 years old. His first girlfriend, he said, only went out for him for money. And he claimed it ended naturally since it was not a relationship out of mutual romantic interest. After their separation, Louis denied feelings of disappointment nor heart heartbroken because he was just being played with for the money. 
his first girlfriend was his first relationship, sexual relations relationship. He had his first back at 20 years of age. Although he, had, he admitted to have courted several women, he did not pursue them seriously because he felt that the women he courted did not like him as much as he liked them. For most of the women he courted, if he feels they do not have affection towards him, he would just stop courting altogether. He also experienced being turned down by a girl he courted once because she was more interested with another man. Moreover, he became more focused on his work and making money for his family. He never let go of his dream, however, that one day he will meet that person who would be willing to spend her life with him and accept him for who he is. His current girlfriend, Lucila, as mentioned in the previous section, and Sheila had a previously been partner with two children, ages 16 and 14 years old. According to Louis' mother, she had later learned that Sheila was married to her Muslim boyfriend of several years in a Muslim ceremony. The relationship was communicated on Facebook. So um, Louis and Sheila's um, relationship has only been communicated through online messaging, and they are yet to get to know each other physically when Sheila's contract abroad ends. They have not yet become acquainted with both of their families, although they plan to have their families meet when Sheila gets home. Louis was brought up in a Roman Catholic family. However, when his siblings were older and had their own families, they converted into a Protestant religion, Christ the Church. The whole family converted, save for Louis and his parents. According to him, he does not describe himself as overly religious and to him, regardless of religious affiliations. Uh, what is important is belief in God and making sure that we do no harm against them, against others. Although he was invest, invited several times by his siblings to convert to their religion, he stood his ground. Louis does not have any history of cases filed against him, nor cases he filed against another person. He has no history of previous arrest, and Louis has no history of involvement in the military. Louis describes himself as a simple person. He dreams to provide his family comforts in life and he hopes of having his own family and is constantly praying for it. Although at times he felt lonely being single, this does not affect his function. He wanted to have his own family and be a father himself so he can raise a child in a different way than his father did. He wanted to prove to his father that he can build his own family and raise his own children better than he did. When Sheila came along, he considered it as an answered prayer. He hoped to be married to Sheila and dreamt of starting a life together. His hopes and dreams were recently threatened with the knowledge of Sheila's marital status. Although he knew Sheila had children from her first partner, he did not see this as a barrier in, this relation, in their relationship and hopes to work this out with Sheila when they get married. He's willing to take care of Sheila's children and do whatever he can to make Sheila feel loved. To him, Sheila did not deserve to be cheated upon like what Sheila experienced in her first partner. The history of substance use for this patient is significant for alcohol and tobacco. Uh, for alcohol, he started it at 13 years of age due to peer pressure and continues to do it for Pakiki's arm. We notice, however, that uh, there was an increase in intake from 20 to 33 years old until he was admitted here in IPBM. After, uh, after he was discharged, he would only take one to, two, three, one to three standard drinks of rum or beer two to three times a month. And his last intake was last January 2020. Uh, also significant for tobacco use, which started at 16 years of age. And he, he does this for pleasure and reduces stress. According to him, uh, although he had stopped smoking from 2018 to 2020, he has recently resumed his smoking at 5 to 10 sticks per day. According to Louis, 5 kung daily stress, 10 kung stressed. And his last intake was on the day of admission. He, was all, he also took marijuana when he was 20 years of age, but only tried it once in 2003. He denied other use of substances. For non-substance use history, Louis denies any form of gambling, internet game use, or any form of non-substance use. For the psychiatric review of systems, we have depressive symptoms characterized as depressed mood, irritability, disturbed sleep, depressed, decreased appetite, and loss of concentration. Some manic symptoms such as irritability, anxiety, are characterized as worries about relationship, and more prominent psychotic symptoms, auditory hallucination, uh, disorganized behavior, and ideas of reference. 
for the review of systems, we have decreased appetite. For the mental status examination, patient was seen and examined brought in by his sister and brother. He has an endomorphic body type and looks appropriate for his age. He was poorly groomed wearing a gray and iron shirt, brown corduroy shorts at knee length, and black rubber slippers. He has unkempt hair and dirty trimmed, and trimmed nails. He came in calm, initially cooperative to, to, the, to the examination, but became uncooperative and hostile in the middle of the interview. He had poor eye contact and kept on staring blankly, sometimes mumbling as if talking to somebody. He needed repeated prodding and a louder voice to catch his attention and answers and, and answer to questions. Although initi uh, initially calm and cooperative to the procedures prior, such as taking a vital signs and doing the drug test, uh, later on, he would suddenly hit his siblings unprovoked and would be agitated when asked to place face mask and face shield. When asked how he felt, he would answer, wala man. Spe although specific mood was asked, but this yielded uh, the same answer. He seemed irritable, however, and even angry at times, and with a blunted affect. Patient had poor attention during the interview, when, where in questions need to be repeated several times before he answers. He spoke deliber deliberately at low volume. Patient admitted to having auditory hallucinations, but refused to expound further at the time of examination. Louis was noted to have thought blocking when answering questions. Uh, he would sometimes pause and not finish the sentence at all. At the time, he denied delusions and did not answer when asked of questions pertaining to ideas of reference, suicidal and homicidal adjacents. During the interview, however, when the incident of his suddenly choking the sister happened and attempted to punch his brother, uh, I tried to ask why he did that, but he did not answer the question did not answer question also pertaining to his girlfriend. This patient had missed, mixed insomnia and he admitted this was because of the auditory hallucinations, sama ayumam. And he had decreased appetite, no, no weight changes noted, he's still more active during the day and with decreased libido. Patient was oriented to person that refused to answer when asked for place and time. He was able to identify his sister and brother when pointed and asked who they were, but he refused to answer where he was nor the date or the, or the day of the week. For memory questions, he was mostly uncooperative to the interview. For concentration and subtraction, I attempted to ask these questions, but he was uh, he, unable to answer. He also refused to answer uh, questions with regards to information and intelligence. For judgment, Patient had impaired social judgment. He, he does not cooperate with the interview. He also showed hostility even if unprovoked. Thus, judgment cannot be assessed because he was uncooperative. At the time, he had partial insight. He was able to realize that the auditory hallucinations had caused him to have disturbed sleep. However, he would deny anything wrong with him when asked why he was brought in and if he had an illness that needed treatment. For the physical examination, this patient was examined conscious and not in cardiopulmonary distress with the following vital signs. The, the physical examination was unremarkable. Neuro, neurologic examination at the time of admission was not done because uh, it was not done because of the status of the patient upon intake interview. However, the patient was noted to be awake or yet oriented to person, and there was no note of asymmetries nor, nor gait abnormalities. I was able to do neurophysical exam at the CIU, March 2, 2021, with the following findings, mostly unremarkable. Also, a neurological, neurological soft signs of schizophrenia was, in, uh, was also included, except for two-point discrimination, which I was not able to do, um, and these are turned negative. For COVID screening, this patient had no cough, no cold, no fever, no loose bowel movement, no history of travel to another locality or country, or not, and no contact with a known case of uh, COVID-19. So for the summary of findings, we are presented with a 38-year-old 30, male, single high school graduate, a tailor, uh, with a family history of psychiatric illness and tuberculosis with marked stressor, with the following psychotic symptoms and mood symptoms, such as irritable, angry mood, and history of worried mood but no other symptoms, depressive and manic symptoms. 
for the organic part, we, we, we have this patient has no known medical disorders, the vital signs and neurological examinations and laboratory results were normal. And he was developmentally at par with age. So at the admission, uh, the admitting impression for this patient was with psychotic disorder with marked stressor recurrent. At this point, do we have question? Uh, I have a clarification, actually two clarifications, Nueva. The yes, first is about the irritable mood, which you classified under manic symptoms. Yes. Uh, will that mean that there will be no irritable, uh, irrit irritability in a depressed patient? Yes, no, I also included irritability in the review of systems for depression. Though. Uh, okay. And then second question is, in your review of systems, can you go back to your review? Of, uh, no. Can you go back? Yeah. Oh, no. The salient features? There. Mood symptoms. Irritable, angry mood. But you mentioned in your review of systems that the patient has depressed mood. Uh, yes, no. I failed to include that in this table though. Okay, so the patient, according to mood symptoms presented, has depressed mood, angry mood, irritability, and history of being worried. Yes, no. Okay, thank you. I, I also had an error here in the demographics, patients who have a family history of psychiatric illness. Family history of psychiatry. Question, Lau. Yes, uh, your, your diagnosis is with marked stressor. Can you define the marked stressor there? Um, according to the DSM-5 uh, specifier, the definition for a marked stressor would be that the, 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 the stress would be markedly stressful to almost anyone in similar circumstances in the individual's culture. So in this patient, the effect of knowing that uh, his girlfriend was uh, is a married person was uh, perfectly stress stressful for him. The threat of a loss of his relationship with his girlfriend. So it uh, it indicates uh, a stressor that uh, is related to integrity. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just a follow up. Yes, though. What was the reaction aside from denying it? What was the, the emotional response of the patient towards the news that the girlfriend was already married? Um, he mentioned, Doc, that he, con he, he continued to text with Sheila. And then he, his emotional reaction was more of worried, Doc that his relationship will come to an end. So just worried? Worried though. Um, he did not mention being angry towards Sheila. No. Okay. So it doesn't, ano, kasi he was worried eh. So ano yun, is it something na uh, parang, if it's a marked stress or is it a normal response no, na you get worried when you, when you find out that your partner would have an affair, diba? yeah. So I was just wondering, because you, ano, uh, gave that, <clears throat> ano ba, uh, diagnosis with marked stressor. Because brief psychotic disorder without marked stressor, diba, isa rin yon. But this one, you identified it as marked stressor. So in other words, uh, being worried about the relationship is considered a marked stressor? Um, aside from being worried, Bob, it seems to him that it, it, it has come to an end. That... Because when you say marked stressor, it could be a threat to integrity, to life, no, or loss.
So how about fear of losing Sheila? I think fear is more up to you, Snow. Isn't it that uh, Sheila became the center of his life when they had yeah. they started to have a relationship? Yes, Snow. I think no. so for the differential diagnosis in this case we have three levels to to you know, to examine is this a medical or a primary psychiatric disorder is this primary mood or a psychotic disorder and we have to check also for comorbidities so for a psychot for for patients presenting with psychosis, we have to check if this is another due to a medical condition or a primary psychiatric disorder. For medical conditions, I consider substance use in, a substance into psychotic disorder and psychosis secondary to another medical condition. So I first ruled substance induced because there was a history of substance use, which is marijuana and alcohol. And then there's the sudden onset of perceptual disturbances. However, we have ruled this out because the last intake of alcohol was last January and uh, the, mark, the, the, the drug test turned out negative. For psychosis secondary to another medical condition, this was again ruled out because of the sudden ruled in because of, because of the sudden onset of perceptual disturbances. However, we have normal physical examination and uh, no known comorbidities for this patient. So we have ruled that out. Then for primary psychiatric disorder, I considered MDD with psychotic features, schizophrenia, and with psychotic disorder. For MDD with psychotic features, I, I ruled this in because this patient is. Uh, is single with depressed mood and decreased appetite in the review of systems as well as disturbed sleep. However, we are able to rule this out because there are no other uh, depressive symptoms such as the following. And then the history was only seven days and is unable to fulfill the criteria for a major depressive episode. Next is schizophrenia disorder. Uh, so this patient also, so this patient presented with psychosis with a history of psychotic illness, uh, with, psych with history of admission in 2016. So the, the, however, I was able to rule this out because the duration is less than one month and the disturbance better was, is better explained by another psychiatric disorder, such as beef psychotic disorder. Then uh, for beef psychotic disorder, I wrote this in because this patient experienced emotional turmoil and um, there's also uh, one month, uh, less than one month history of auditory hallucinations, delusions, disorganized behavior, the duration of two days and disturbance not better explained by other psychiatric disorder. So I was... Nev, yes, no. Can we clarify something? Yes, but no. With the BPD, beef psychotic disorder, I was just wondering, you know, after the 2016 episode, would mm -hmm. you say that the patient returned to baseline functioning? Yes, no. Uh, he only took risperidone for a year, then discontinued after. Then he had no, ano, doc, so no psychotic episodes 2017, 2018 until up to this admission. Doc. And uh, he returned to baseline functioning for doc. How how would we say that the patient returned to baseline functioning? I noticed that with in terms of social interaction, there was a decrease, right? Um, it's uh, in terms of going out with friends. Tama ba to? Or did I hear it? I know. Bro. He was described to go back to his old self, no? Pala historia, and he would go out to the neighbors. But he did decrease the alcohol intake, though. Ah, okay. So socially, uh, the patient yeah, returned to screen morbid functioning socially. Yes, Occupationally? Yes, no. He returned to another. Also did. Thank you. So I also examined uh, to be to use disorder for this case with the following reasons I ruled this in. Um, he had the history of attempt to quit. However, he resumed uh, smoking. Uh, there was a loss of control. There's an unsuccessful effort to stop and continue to use despite problems. There's also tolerance because um, he mentioned there's a disappearance of nausea and dizziness after repeated intake and with more intense effect of the tobacco use uh, the first time it is 
it is used during the day and also withdrawal characterized as headaches uh, when he stops smoking. So this is my working impression. Beef psychotic disorder with marked stress or recurrent to make we use disorder moderate severity. So for biopsychosocial formulation, um, so we are presented with the case of Ruby, a 38-year-old tailor, single, who manifested psychotic symptoms after a threat of loss of romantic relationship. Ruby grew up in a financially challenged family who, who valued hard work and survival of the family as priority. As the first male born of six children, he was expected at an early age to devote efforts in economic and divorce to the family. Despite his dedication, Ruby's father, Mario, was very critical of mistakes and failures. Without, without a self-object to provide accurate mirroring of his true talents and abilities, Ruby has never developed a stable sense of his own worth. Moreover, Louis also needed to be able to idealize a self-object and bask in the glow of that idealization in order to feel strong and good and safe. However, Louis' father was absent most of the time due to work and often lacked the time to spend with Louis. When he was present, however, Mario was not able to make Louis feel calm and comfortable. Lacking mirroring and idealizing transparency during childhood led to development of low self-esteem and resulted in Louis' inability to have positive feelings about himself. With a fragile self-esteem, Louis becomes vulnerable to self-esteem threats. Self -esteem threats. Louis also developed less adaptive internal responses to self, um, including the uh, responses to self-esteem threats by self-deprecation. His defenses include denial by disavowing unacceptable feelings and thoughts, avoidance, choosing to walk away when there is conflict, and ultimately regression using strategies from earlier periods of development to deal with stressful events or feelings manifested by his tobacco use as a stress motor. Louis' sense of self has not been solid, solidly established and its position and firmness depend upon the presence of a self-object. Louis' longing to have an intimate relationship and have his own family is related to the need for a self-object as a supportive matrix. Louis necessitates a self-object to maintain emotional equilibrium and self-cohesion which he sought in Sheila. The threat of loss of his relationship with Sheila is a narcissistic injury to an already fragile self-esteem. Loss of this self-object leads to a crisis or to a regressive fragmentation, which manifested as psychosis. Because of his tendency to castigate himself and sensitivity to criticism, which was derived from lack of mirroring transferences mentioned above, Louis experienced auditory hallucinations that were dependent and criticizing of him. Several factors in the biological aspect of Louis Louis' case also predisposed him to develop psychosis. Prenatally, Louis' mother had poor intake of nutrition aside from financial constraints at the time. She also failed to avail the vitamins and regular checks, checkups at the health center. Louis is biologically predisposed to develop psychosis because of a positive psychiatric history in maternal cousin. Morbid risk for psychosis in the first, second, and third degree relatives can be as much as 10.9%. Furthermore, Louis' childhood experiences from his father provided the basis for the gene-by-environment interaction. This causes a neurobiological sensitivity that predisposed him to develop psychosis in response to stressors. Multiple genes containing normal DNA sequences for those that encode dysfunctional proteins would cause normal genes and proteins to be activated or silenced at wrong times by the environment. This produces mutated variants of neurotransmitter receptors or transporters which causes inefficient neurotransmission. With threat of loss of relationship with his girlfriend, this vulnerability was triggered to develop a neurotransmitter pathology, specifically hyperactivity of beta receptor transmission in subcortical and limbic brain regions, leading to manifestations of psychosis. So data use is both a precipitating and perpetuating factor in this case. Nicotine stimulates dopamine release in both target areas throughout the brain. There is also an NMDA receptor hypofunction on GABAergic interneurons, resulting in reduced inhibition of pyramidal glutamate with excess glutamate release, leading to activation of dopaminergic neurons. The propagative properties of nicotine appear to be linked to nicotine-induced release of dopamine in mesocortical pathways connecting the VTA with cortical regions, including the PFC. 
Another precipitating and perpetuating factor in this case is the, the socioeconomic sequelae of pandemic. A factor that boosted Louis' self-esteem before was his income and his role as provider in the family. This was thought due to the pandemic, wherein economic economies were put in pause and income opportunities dwindled. Protective factors in this case include uh, Louis' good response to pharmacotherapy, physical health, insight to illness upon discharge, access to psychiatric services, mitigation from local health system, assistance or and social services in their community. Louis also has tailoring skills that he can use to earn money when he becomes able, and he has good family support, which is another factor that can ensure compliance to medications and follow. So for the question awards, the patient was received at the emergency room and assessed to need psychiatric inpatient management because of the risk of harm to others. The psychiatric goals for treatment of this are to control the disturbed behavior and psychotic symptoms and prevent harm to others, affect a rapid return to the best level of functioning. Through pharmacotherapy and inpatient treatment setting, determine and address the factors that led to the occurrence of the acute episode and develop alliance with the patient and the family, build rapport and improve insight to illness. This can be done by establishing therapeutic alliance and thorough interview with patient and family and supportive psychotherapy as well. We can also connect the patient to the right aftercare community with the following plans and ensure proper nutrition by referral to the dietary for counseling. Long-term goals would include prevention of relapse and insurance of compliance to medication and personality development so we can refer to NDP and psychotherapy and address the data use by motivational interviewing. So the patient was admitted to CIU single cell after assessment and the ER and based on labs were ordered with the following rationale. Since this patient was also started on antipsychotics, FBS and lipid profile was taken as baseline. And because they predisposed the patient to develop type 2 DN and hyperlipidemia at 2 to 5 times uh, risk. Also, for these patients, they would have poor diet and sedentary lifestyle and those socioeconomic factors and income factors can also uh, contribute to developing this disease. Consequently, liver and renal function test was also taken for they are involved in biotransformation and excretion of drugs, respectively. This patient also had a history of alcohol abuse, so it would be prudent also to check for liver function as well. We also took baseline ECG. And since antipsychotic medications are linked to serious ventricular arrhythmia and sudden cardiac death, especially in higher doses. And some of them so, uh, cause prolongation of the QTC and a risk factor for their sudden point. So and these are the lab results of the patient, which are unremarkable here in CBC urinalysis. analysis. Clinical chemistry, however, had showed slight elevations of the SGAP and SGBC. So I will go to that later. Um, I started risperdone in this patient with the following advantages. So it, first, it has advantages over, over the first generation antipsychotics because of a better side effect profile compared to the FGAs. Risperdone would also have lesser sedation and risk of weight gain compared to lansapine since this patient is a tailor and would require to be alert during his daytime job and his BMI is 28, which is overweight. Also, risperidone is readily available in rehab centers and local health centers as well. So this is just a table showing comparing risperidone to other uh, SDAs in terms of side effects. So... Uh, risperidone may actually cause liver test abnormalities, especially in patients who are on long-term risperidone with as much as 30%. And distributed elevations may actually may usually be mild, transient, and may resolve even with continuation of medication. And, and the onset of injury typically occurs within a few days of starting risperidone and resolves rapidly with stopping. For this patient, this patient had a history of alcohol use. Uh, we can usually see derangements in liver enzymes with a particularly increased ratio of SGOT and S over SGOT um, for alcohol abuse. Um, for this patient, we checked, however, the SGOT, SGBT again. And um, so on day two and three, 
from me. The patient was noted to be calm and cooperative when given medications, and he was noted to shout. However, was noted to shout in his cell with hallucinatory gestures and disturbed sleep. So uh, we gave one uh, clonazepam at one fourth tablet two times a day for three days. Medications with the, within the benzodiazepine class may prove helpful to ameliorate symptom manifestation in acutely psychotic individuals. Also, risperidone was increased to 2 mg and a half tab at AM and 1 tab at HS on hospital day 3. On day 4 to 5, patient was already noted to be calm and cooperative, conversant with youth, I make mood, and, but however, still with blunted affect. Able to recall events leading to admission, he was more cooperative to um, mental status exam, but still admits to having auditory hallucinations, although he cannot expound further at that time. We increased risperidone to one tab BID and started uh, psychoeducating the patient and supportive psychotherapy was rendered. So psychoeducation for this patient consists of medically informing the patient and also their fa his family about this condition and treatment modalities employed for this particular patient. For supportive psychotherapy, some techniques that was employed was um, first, of course, the therapeutic alliance was uh, built and during interviews this patient was listened to with display of interest feedback was given also with regards to his symptoms and problems and was also given in empathy interest and responsive and explanatory comments so uh, praise is given when it was appropriate as when the patient cooperates with taking medications as well so on day six and seven the patient became calm conversant cooperative with uh, in-depth history taking, patient had euthymic mood, blunted, uh, spontaneous speech, denied auditory hallucinations and delusions, and denied ideas of reference. He was added to three spheres, able to subtract a series of sevens from 100 and spell backwards and forwards, and also do abstract thinking. He also demonstrated a good fund of knowledge with unimpaired judgment and partial insight to illness. We continued supportive psychotherapy. And then and his RT-PCR results turned negative for COVID, and he was subsequently discharged on the eighth hospital day on risperidone, two milligram per tab, one tab, two times a day. So, although BPD, BPD characteristic, characteristically shows complete resolution of symptoms within one month of symptom onset, it is suggested to continue treatment with antipsychotics for one to three months after symptom remission. And also, during the treatment process, the patient should be monitored on a long-term basis to assess for relapse or presence of residual symptoms. While 50 to 80% of our patients diagnosed with BPD would maintain the diagnosis for, uh, for some time. However, there are some studies uh, that I mentioned about relapses within a two-year period, as much as 50 to 70%. So, a follow-up consult after one week at the OPD was done and Dewey was seen welcomed during follow-up wearing a clean uh, white shirt, black pants, and leather shoes. He had euthymic mood and appropriate affect. He was compliant to medications and showed eagerness to fully recover from his illness. He denied any perceptual disturbances and delusions. He was oriented to three spheres and provided accurate answers to sensorium and cognition and questions. He had full insight to his illness. During follow-up, NPT was also requested to assess for IQ and other personality factors that may be relevant in psychotherapy. The overall treatment plan for BPD should ideally include both pharmacological and psychosocial interventions. The biological, psychological, and social dimensions of this patient's life should in unison dictate the eventual treatment decisions made for this patient. It is also essential to focus on managing comorbid disorders or stressors and improving overall coping skills. For this patient, motivational interviewing to address the tobacco use as well as psychotherapy to develop better coping skills is planned. While long-term goals for this patient would be better carried out with face-to-face -face encounters, the ensuing pandemic travel restrictions as well as econom economic costs for this patient is considered. Uh, for this patient, I, can say I offered the teleconsultation option uh, to the patient and to the patient's family to facilitate this. So the, the, the discharge diagnosis for this patient is brief psychotic disorder with marked stressor recurrent tobacco use disorder, moderate severity. 
So, can I speak? Yes, but no. So, considering this patient had a previous psychotic episode, and looking at what his psychodynamics may be, what would you focus on in therapy? Um, I would focus on his coping skills, no? Which Probably. one? Um, so what, what are his, what are your assessed strengths and weaknesses? What will make him vulnerable to another relapse? His coping and how will you work that out in therapy? I can see that his defense mechanisms though are more on denial, avoidance, and then uh, he is uh, uh, regressing more to using substance use, which is to bake auto, especially when he is stressed. So um, the strength for this patient is that he is really willing to uh, to recover. And previously, uh, although he was a heavy drinker before, after he was admitted and he was psychoeducated that drinking can exacerbate his condition, he really did reduce it though. So, so that's a good point though for him. So probably I can do a, 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 a aim to improve his coping skills though, more on health. How coping. are you going to deal with substance abuse? I can do another. With alcoholism as a more concrete treatment management? Uh, for for the big use though, we can do motivational interviewing wherein we can elicit um, phrases of change from the patient himself. Then um, for her coping skills, though, uh, probably um, behavioral therapy. That's all you're going to do, motivational interviewing? Then what? And motivational interviewing for the tobacco use, though. And then uh, behavioral therapy for the, for the coping skills, though. Like? Um, like cognitive behavioral therapy, though. So we can change his... Uh, the way he reacts or behaves towards certain uh, triggers. No? How long have you seen this patient? I'm sorry, though. No? How long have you seen this patient? Uh, this patient was admitted for eight days, though, no? and outpatient, though, no? I've seen him twice. No? So, what's your concrete plan as far as CBT? Um, so I, I scheduled the patient. Because now I think for, the goal should really be pre relapse prevention and enhancing, yes. enhancing well-being. Yes, no. So I, um, in the previous uh, follow-up note, I referred the patient also for NPP. And then I plan to do psychotherapy when he gets back. No? It's, it's scheduled to come back tomorrow also. So maybe you should be able to discuss that more concretely with him. Make a contract for CBT or whatever. Have you explained CBT? Yes, uh, I've only tried it a few times, Doc. So, but we were taught by Doctor Ancheta, Doc. We had a subject on CBT, Doc. Mm -hmm. She'll have to implement that more properly. Yes, so what what challenges considering his psychodynamics what challenges do you expect in therapy um he still lives with his father dog and they still have this uh um he still has this animosity towards his father and that's something siguro that we have to work on also like family counseling perhaps then other challenges though siguro with the um what is the main sorry i was a little late what is the main stressor it is, was it a relationship issue yes doc it was a relationship issue though so how are you going to process that that's the main breaking point yes doc um so I'm going to because it seems that he was reaching out to Sheila Doc as a supportive matrix. He he mentions that Sheila was the one who seems to complete him. So when it was the this relationship was an turn like uh, like what happened, 
it was a blow to his self-esteem though. And um, maybe uh, during the process of psychotherapy with this patient, we can make him see that uh, he has more value though, other than the relationship. So how do you make patients see that like this particular patient that he is worth a person by himself without Sheila. How do you do that in therapy? Is, is CBT going to achieve that? Is it remember that's the precipitating stress or you'll have to process that we can that another, wound yes. and make him whole again. We can have him recognize his strengths no? and his good skills so that he can be at this point. Maybe just reflect on how you can do that more completely. And I come Is up it with safe to say, but when you're doing it in therapy, how exactly do you intend to do that? I mean, what's, what's your roadmap? And how will that integrate with CBT? Anyway, food for reflection. Yes, no. I'll I know that doc. I'll come up with a plan for CBT for this patient or and then I know how to do non psychotherapy in in the active psychosis. I, I did read some journals on CBT being done on psychotic patients, though. No, on, on BPD. And on, on BPD, though. No. Uh, the journal I read was more on schizophrenia, though. CBT and schizophrenia. Anyway, think about it. Yes, no, I'll, I'll read on that and have it supervised. No. Um, is there any more? Can I proceed? Oh. Uh, wait, uh, just a comment. Yes, no. Um, I agree with Dr. Bing. Uh, uh, when you when you plan for psychotherapy or what type of psychotherapy you want to do with this patient, you first look at the things that uh, the, the, the a list of problems that the patient had. Yes. No. And then after that, of course, uh, you already address the biological aspect of the illness. The patient is no longer psychotic. Is that correct? Yes. No. The patient is no longer psychotic. Okay, and then uh, the there are you you mentioned through his lifetime that there were issues as he was growing up, which probably uh, caused the the break in his ego, yes, and he became psychotic. So what? So the stressor was the relationship. So you you just just. Uh, you, you check what is the meaning of the relationship for him. How does he see his sense, uh, his sense of self? Was he relying more on Sheila for his self-definition? And then Sheila has, uh, uh, Sheila is married pala to another and then there's this feeling of loss. So, so there are, um, you, you need to go back to your history and explore. That's why it's it's difficult to assume things in psychotherapy. Uh, the reason why I asked you about the details of how he felt, his reaction towards the possibility of losing Sheila and the relationship, uh, because you will use that in psychotherapy. And then, uh, and big weakness ng patient, na? Yes. It, uh, from, from what I'm seeing, his sense of self is through his productivity. Yes, no. A and why is that? So, so ma ano mo siya ba? Yung i-dugtong-dugtong rin siya. Okay. 
I'll work on that now. So, for the prognosis of this patient, so by definition, the course of this psychotic disorder is less than one month, and 50 to 80 percent of all patients have no further major psychiatric problems. However, in a German study, there are 70 percent relapses in a two year follow up, and the length of acute and residual symptoms are often just a few days. Occasionally, depressive symptoms follow the resolution of the psychotic symptom. Suicide is a concern during both the psychotic phase and the post-psychotic depressive phase. For this patient, however, the last uh, on the last follow up, he was already out with the neighbors as well and and has has gone out socially. And several indicators have been associated with good prognosis for this patient: um, good morbid functioning, few schizoid traits, sudden onset of the symptom, the presence of a marked stressor. Uh, confusion and perplex perplexity during psychosis and little affective blunting and short duration of symptoms are indications of a good prognosis for this patient. So for my discussion, I'm going to have Sorry, a Sorry, excuse me. Can you go back to the previous slide? Yes, uh, I was just a thought. Did mm -hmm. you have significant relationships with like friends, best friends, or drinking bodies lang? Uh, friends doc na siya na ay doc tulo doc na friends siya sa sa community doc okay which he is open to he discusses yes, his problems uh, with relationship factors doc na jo ano siya doc the she is not very open when in terms of romantic relationships even to his mother doc okay So our current setting in terms of tele, telehealth is that we have uh, two lines, Globe and Smart Networks, that are dedicated for teleconsultation and mostly for um, regularly following up with patients and used for prescription refill. Um, so upon the search of this patient, this patient was asked for follow-up for a week and we're in follow-up consult was done. Uh, motivational interviewing was started and NPT scheduling. Uh, due to COVID restrictions and risk of infections, arrangements for the follow up, for, follow, for the next, for other follow ups, uh, we offered teleconsultation. So, on the second week post discharge, teleconsult was done and it evolved on maintaining an adherence to medication and continued motivational interviewing. So, a study on telehealth practices shows that patients' adherence to discharge planning. The discharge plans subsequent to inpatient care tended to have a higher rate of verified aftercare attendance. And furthermore, blended treatment consisting of face-to-face -face intervention, motivational inter interviewing, as well as cognitive behavioral therapy, increased treatment compliance and improved treatment outcomes due to increased flexibility of treatment of the treatment course. This approach can be scaled up, and when successful, this has the potential to become an alternative offer in many outpatient clinics. So the advantages of uh, using telehealth would be the cost reduction for the patient. Also, interventions have potential to reach a wider geographic area via remote delivery of care and lowering consumer threshold for initiation of treatment. Also, we can use uh, telehealth to ensure adherence to medication and follow-up, as well as in, for this pandemic infection prevention as well. Uh, in our setting, however, we have limitations such as um, mobile signal or equipment malfunctions at times and some areas will have poor signal as well. Then telepsychiatry involving video conferencing is not yet established in our institution. Um, it would be better that the patient and the psychiatrist would see each other virtually and also we do not yet ha have local guidelines in IPBM regarding use of telepsychiatry to protect both patient and physician. So while telehealth approaches are noble in our setting, it's used in improving outpatient care services. Given its studied and yet to be seen advantages, it's a good area to be explored for the improvement of psychiatric care in our community. So that ends my report. Thank
Thank you, Dr. Perucho, for a very informative presentation. Um, at this point, um, do any of the consultants have additional questions or um, any comments for? Well, I would just like to commend Reva for a very good presentation. For the, You are still a first year, but you... Her presentation is very good. Um, the only thing you need to do is to really, uh, because uh, I had this impression that you are focusing more on the alcoholism and tobacco use. But uh, if you notice, it was uh, to break, uh, the tobacco use was only increased in response to the problems with his relationship. So I, I think you should focus first. Your priority should be helping this patient resolve the issue of his relationship and then moving on from there. Yes, uh, you having said that, Doc, I realized that I'm more lacking on the psychotherapeutic aspects with, this, with regards to this patient. But nonetheless, I, congratulations. Thank you, Doc. I'll ask for your supervision for that doc in the psychotherapy. Um, any other um, um I, I would like to uh, know, uh, comment. Uh, so Neva, I agree with Dr. Padilla. This is a very well prepared presentation. Um, I was just wondering, you know, that maybe it would have added to our um fund of knowledge if you could have researched about recurrent brief psychotic disorder since I know it's not really part of the DSM uh, diagnosis, no? the recurrent BPD, but we have seen patients like this in the OPD and in private practice. So it would be good to update, to have updates on management as well as if there are studies being conducted to be um, for, the, for uh, the recurrent BPD for for the recurrent BPD to be included in, I don't know, the next revision of DSM, perhaps? Yes, no. I came across studies, though, comparing acute transient psychosis of ICD-10 and brief psychotic disorder of DSM-5. And they also, they, they mentioned, though, that they maintained their diagnosis. Uh, 70 to 80% of them would maintain their diagnosis. However, the risk of relapse is still high for brief psychotic disorder at 50 to 70% doc, in a two-year relapse study doc. This was done in Germany. But we have very few journals no, with regards to um, yes, doc, I'll look into that. Um, if there are no more comments, doctor, um, thank you so much for uh, gracing us with your presence. Thank you again, Dr. Perucho, for a very well-prepared um, case presentation. Congratulations. Thank you, doctors, for your time. Uh, shall we take a picture, Bob? I will, can we ask everyone to, I know, to have their videos on for? One, two, three. Okay, done. Thank you, doctors. Thank you, Thank doctors. You.